In 1871, the Second French Empire collapsed. This collapse was the result of one of the most completely botched wars in history. The French Emperor Napoleon III, under massive pressure from his government, press and aristocracy, declared war on Prussia over a matter of honour related to an argument over the Spanish royal succession, and the French army invaded German territory shortly thereafter. This was the first mistake of the many France would make in the war. As the aggressor, France was not able to gain international support and was left militarily and diplomatically isolated. France proceeded to do everything wrong over the course of the next six months, and in January 1871, German soldiers paraded victoriously through the streets of Paris. Napoleon III had abdicated, and French power and prestige lay in ruins. The French performance in the Franco-Prussian War was a masterclass in failed leadership and botched execution. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is the cinematic equivalent of France's failed war on Prussia. The movie does everything wrong, and the result is a disaster every bit as calamitous as the French collapse of 1870. In this video I will not be discussing everything that Indy 5 does wrong because YouTube servers do not possess enough space for a video of that length. I will be focusing on the movie's main problems characters and plot. An Indiana Jones movie has five main characters, Indy, his main adventuring companion, his sidekick, the villain, and the MacGuffin, the ancient relic which Indy seeks. For example, in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, the companion is the hot bimbo, the sidekick is short round, the villain is Mola Ram, and the MacGuffin is the Sankara Stones. In Indy 5, Disney Lucasfilm gets all of the main characters wrong, including Indy himself, and the plot is a disorganised shambles of incoherent chaos that would make a mid-19th century battlefield appear an exemplar of order in comparison. Disney Lucasfilm seemed to think that any man over the age of 50 must be depicted on screen as incompetent, dumb, world weary, almost entirely useless, largely devoid of agency and in need of a feisty young woman to inject some meaning back into his tired existence. In The Reva Show, a middle-aged Obi-Wan Kenobi is depicted as a spirit-broken, weary old cuck wage slave day worker, barely able to swing a lightsaber anymore because he's given up on his training. This in spite of the fact that as an old man, Obi-Wan saves Luke from the Sand People, devises a plan to get vital stolen intelligence to the Rebel Alliance, smuggles the droids into Mos Eisley, wipes out two guys hassling Luke in a bar, secures passage to Alderaan on a smuggler ship, trains Luke, infiltrates the Death Star, powers down the Death Star tractor beam and faces down Darth Vader, whom he may well have beaten had he not chosen to sacrifice himself, and, ultimately, he succeeds in his mission to get the droids to the Rebel Alliance. This same character was depicted thusly by Disney Lucasfilm. You want my help? Take this. Walk into the middle of the desert and bury it in the ground. Stay hidden. Live a normal life. The time of the Jedi is over. In his case, it's a feisty young toddler that injects some meaning into his life. She's a tad young to be convincing as a great motivator, but that's okay because... <laughs> I'm not going to talk about what Disney did to Luke Skywalker because there are planets in the solar system that have not been examined as much as the deconstruction of Luke. I will just show you two clips from Return of the Jedi, followed by a few clips from The Last Jedi. Here is the real Luke Skywalker. <laughs> failed your highness i am a jedi like my father before me here is disney luke skywalker Boba Fett was turned from an utterly brutal bounty hunter who murdered people for money into this
Han Solo is portrayed in The Force Awakens as almost exactly the same as he is portrayed in Indiana Jones 5. He's world weary, divorced, has lost all drive and is just going through the motions while he waits to drop. He's done with adventuring for the good guys and he has lost his son. In Indy 5 his son is killed in Vietnam and in The Force Awakens his son has become a genocidal imperial who now calls himself Kylo Ren. In both movies he is awakened from his stupor of moral indifference and inactivity by a feisty, young, English-accented brunette. Similar treatment has been suffered by Picard. I am content to be demoted to captain. Sheer fucking hubris. You think you could just waste back in here and be entrusted with taking men and women into space? And more recently, Nick Fury in the recent Marvel show Secret Invasion, which has absolutely bombed on Disney+, Plus. its debut pulling in less than 1 million views. Quick aside here, Secret Invasion's intro is a series of AI art generated images layered over the top of music that is so generic and forgettable that it sounds like it too has been generated by an AI program, and it is shockingly bad. It looks like an art project thrown together at the last minute by an 11 year old boy who was relieved when the teacher gave him a C minus but who also feels guilty because he and everyone else in the class knows he should have gotten an F. In honour of Secret Invasion's innovative use of AI, the next minute of this video will be comprised entirely of AI images and music. The has been former hero who is now little more than an old, tired, pathetic husk of his former self is itself an old, tired, pathetic, woke trope that audiences are thoroughly sick of. People don't pay good money to go to the cinema so they can see their childhood hero turned into an alcoholic who is easily fooled by a feisty young woman no one asked for, or to see the man who once pulled a blaster on Darth Vader being schooled in how to use the Millennium Falcon by a jumped up desert girl. They don't pay to see Luke Skywalker drinking green milk from the tit of a beach mammal. We know that men get weaker and slower as they age. No one expects Old Man Indy to run from death through an obstacle course, but there is no good reason that a great character short of going senile in old age should become gullible, stupid, all round less competent and develop personality traits that are contrary to his inherent nature. In a lecture to his students, it is obvious that Dr. Jones has lost his touch as a lecturer, and instead of the enraptured youths of decades past, his audience is now a hall of indifferent students literally bored to sleep. Not that Dr. Jones seems to care. He is easily fooled by his co-lead character who was included in the film due to popular demand, Helena Shaw, played by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who behaves like an uninvited house guest who not only overstays her welcome, but quickly decides that she is now the owner of the house and that those who live inside it must pay her due deference. This character convinces Indy to show her the dial by reintroducing herself to him in a bar, remember me, I'm your goddaughter, and presenting him with the prospect of a last great adventure. Indiana Jones is a man who has decades of experience with liars, cheats, and thieves. Dr. Jones, again we see there is nothing you can possess which I cannot take away. And you thought I'd given up. Who has been betrayed by those he has worked closely with? Throw me the idol, I throw you the whip. Give me the whip. Adios, senor. Indy, please. Snatch. What? Trust me. Indy, no! I will kill her. Huh? Go ahead. No! Don't shoot. should have listened to your father. Who does not allow sentimentality to cloud his judgment? Well, I'm coming with you, Jones. Get me out of here. Cut me loose. You can't leave me here. If I take you out of here now, they'll start combing the place for us. Jones, you gotta get me out of here. Come on, Jones, are you? Get back to get you. But in Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, he quickly casts aside all doubts about this woman claiming to be his goddaughter, who he last saw when she was 12, and takes her to see the dial she has expressed such enormous interest in. Indy is shocked when this woman he has known for five minutes, and who suggested they go search for the Dial of Destiny together, steals the dial from him and runs off with it. The duplicitous wench responds to his protestation with a smug one-liner and runs off. So these are our two heroes, an extremely gullible, 
unstable, depressed, borderline alcoholic old man who used to be Indiana Jones and a thieving con woman. We will soon be introduced to a third member of the gang who manages to be just as unpleasant a screen presence as the interloper, but more on him later. Helena Shaw is the new character no one wanted that Kathleen Kennedy decided everyone wanted and needed to see on screen in an Indiana Jones movie. And the first thing she does is screw over Indy, rob him and leave him for shit. This is to demonstrate that she is smarter and wilier than him. And why does Indy later forgive and place his trust in this woman who five minutes ago lied to him and ripped him off so she could enrich herself by selling an important historical artifact on the black market? because Kathleen Kennedy wants this money-grubbing philistine in the movie as much as possible, and if that means Dr. Jones' IQ has to drop a few dozen points, then so be it. And that is, by far, the biggest problem with this intruder into the Indiana Jones story. There's too much of her. Far too much. The ideal amount of Phoebe Waller-Bridge in this movie would be zero. If she absolutely has to be in the movie, have her badly wounded in the parade shootout. Indy shows up to see her in hospital, and after a tearful apology, an admission that she just wanted to live up to her father's legacy and be an adventurer like Indy, she confesses all and tells Indy everything she knows, which gives him a clue as to where the bad guy might be. Later on, Indy can call her and ask her to do some important research for him. Eager to redeem herself, she agrees, and later reports back to him on the phone, not in person, the results of her findings, which leads Indy on to his next clue. There. Nice little redemption arc for her. Even with that, she would still be an annoying character that probably has the most cringe moment in the entire movie with her roof jump in high heels. But seeing her wounded would be cathartic and an emotional hospital scene with Indy would make for an appropriate end to act one. But no, instead, she's in almost every scene that has Indy in it. In the first movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indy is often alone, doing what men do. Solving puzzles, finding solutions, and being a generally resourceful, active, masculine hero. But at no point throughout the excessive runtime of Diet of Destiny is Indiana Jones left alone to just be Indiana Jones. Instead, we have this insufferable trespasser doing everything with him. Throughout the entirety of this movie, Indy's intended replacement clings to him like a bad smell, and she doesn't compliment him in any way. She has no skills that he does not already possess. Indy can jump over a big hole in the ground. She can spider person her way between buildings. He can single-handedly take on a moving convoy of German soldiers. She can throw herself on a moving car and strangle the villain while pushing the rifles of the muscle-bound goons out of her way. He can get a girl angry with a good old pump and dump. I never meant to hurt you. I was a child. I was in love. It was wrong and you knew it. You knew what you were doing. She can leave an ex heartbroken and coming after her in tears with an entire convoy of simp allies. He can sneak onto a German base and take out a few bad guys. She can sneak onto a moving plane and take out an entire cargo hold full of bad guys. He can have a funny, adorable sidekick who can just about drive a car. She can have a sidekick who's older and can drive cars very well, drive any plane without experience, pick pockets, take out men 14 times his size, stop the bad guys at a critical moment and do anything else the script needs him to do. Indy can read an ancient Greek cipher, she can read it faster. He can speak ancient Greek, she can speak it better. He has an expert knowledge of ancient history and antiquity, she has a more expert knowledge of ancient history and antiquity. The whole point of pairing a hero with a sidekick is that the sidekick complements the hero in some way. In GoldenEye, the smoking hot Bond girl, Natalia, is a computer programmer. She's not an assassin who can shoot henchmen or plant surveillance devices in well-guarded locations or win at poker or seduce beautiful women. She's just a computer programmer. That skill turns out to be very useful to Bond and allows him to gain vital intelligence on the villain. He also has other uses for Natalia. Natalia compliments Bond. There are important reasons for him to keep her around. Let's look at another example of a complementary on-screen relationship, this time platonic and with an age gap comparable with that between Helena Shaw and Indy. Sean and Will in Good Will Hunting. 
Sean provides older male authority, wisdom and mentorship that Will has never had in his life and Will is young and honest enough to give Sean a no bullshit assessment of Sean's self-defeating attitude. Helena Shaw is a highly intelligent expert archaeologist, linguist, heartthrob, yes according to this movie she's a bombshell that sends men wild with lust. No comment. Yet. Adventurer who isn't afraid to get her hands dirty to obtain valuable ancient artifacts, who uses her wiles to get out of sticky situations, her incredible puzzle solving ability to find clues and seems to possess an inexhaustible supply of stamina and determination. She's got a child sidekick and she's an action hero possessing of unnatural physical strength and almost suicidal bravery. And she leaves a trail of broken hearted men in her wake. Does this sound familiar? Of course it does. She's Indiana Jones. She's an idealized feminist version of Indiana Jones, but without the humor, charm and charisma. This is why her character doesn't work at all. We already have an Indiana Jones. We don't need another one. Having a not even secondary character, a second main character in the movie with an identical skill set to the titular character is pointless. That would be like having two James Bonds, they would just get in each other's way and turn the movie into a convoluted slog, which is what Indiana Jones and the female Indiana Jones is. An absolute slog. If Helena Shaw was, for example, a trainee doctor who could treat the inevitable wounds and injuries that old man Indy will sustain on his adventure, that would be really useful. It would be quite complementary to the character of an adventurer engaging in activities that he is at least 30 years too old for. The secondary but still massive problem with two Indiana Joneses is that both of them are the main character and both require extensive screen time. This is why the movie drags more ass than a cowboy lassoing Lizzo across the Texan desert. As batshit all over the place as the plot is, the movie might have been decent if it didn't have Indiana Jane dragging down every scene she was in, making it twice as long as it needed to be. And setting aside the problems with her character, there is zero chemistry between Harrison Ford and Phoebe Waller-Bridge. Now when I say chemistry, I don't mean sexual chemistry. Not that there would be anything wrong with that, age is just a number. My man Al Pacino recently welcomed his fifth child into the world at the age of 83 with his girlfriend of 29. Let not age nor any other contrivance of man stand as a barrier to true love. Al, congratulations King. I believe I can speak for all of the Despot subscribers in wishing you and your family the very best and expressing our hope that you live long enough for your son to have fond, joy-filled memories of you. You know what's crazy is that 170 years after Al Pacino was born, his son will probably still be alive. That's like if Oscar Wilde's son was still alive today. The chemistry I am referring to when I talk about the vibe between Harrison Ford and his co-star is not sexual chemistry, it's on-screen chemistry. There needs to be good chemistry between the actors in order for their characters to be believable and compelling on screen. Here are a few examples of screen duos that had great chemistry. Miyagi and Daniel-san in The Karate Kid, Doc and Marty in Back to the Future, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke in Star Wars, Clint Eastwood and Hilary Swank in Million Dollar Baby, Lecter and Starling in The Silence of the Lambs, Harrison Ford and Sean Connery in Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, Will and Sean from Good Will Hunting, Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones in Men in Black, and perhaps the most celebrated screen geo in history, Will Smith and Jaden Smith in Lost on Planet Nepotism. You're wrong! An actor may be very good for a part and the director and studio may really like him, but if he doesn't match well with the main actor, he won't be cast. For example, Pat Morito was not cast as Mr. Miyagi until he had auditioned with Ralph Macchio, despite the filmmakers loving his solo auditions. Now I doubt there is an actress on this planet that could make the character of Helena Shaw compelling. But that aside, there is just nothing going on in terms of chemistry between the two leads in Indy 5. I don't get the sense that they would hate each other. It's not the anti-chemistry of Jai Courtney and Amelia Clark in Terminator Genesis. Their characters are supposed to fall in love and in a bliss of passion produce the future leader of the human resistance to the machines. But Jai Courtney and Amelia Clark gave the impression that they would not fuck if they were trapped together in a Las Vegas penthouse for a month with nothing 
nothing to eat but aphrodisiacs and Viagra pills. The problem in Indy 5 is that I never get the impression that the two leads would ever have any fondness for one another, that their characters really care about each other. This becomes painfully blatant near the end when Indy and Indiana Jane are arguing about Indy's desire to stay in the past. The movie wants us to believe that there is a deep emotional connection between these characters, but I just can't believe it. Pat Morito and Ralph Macchio had a magical connection when they performed together in The Karate Kid that makes the movie incredibly immersive. It's one of the reasons the movie became a surprise smash hit. There is no connection between Harrison Ford and Phoebe Waller-Bridge. There is only a giant gaping chasm of nothing. This emptiness between them makes an already unwatchable movie even worse. The Force Awakens is a crap movie, basically just a glossy knockoff of A New Hope, but I can admit that there was good chemistry between Daisy Ridley and Harrison Ford, and it does help the movie limp into the realm of watchability. Harrison Ford and Phoebe Waller-Bridge go together about as well as a wank and a fold-out of Phoebe Waller-Bridge. They are not complimentary. The most visually unpleasant aspect of Indiana Jones is the bullshit girl boss choreography in the action scenes, which look like exactly what they are. A ham-fisted attempt to suggest that women are just as capable of action and violence as men, aided by the agonizingly obvious assistance of the stuntmen. Phoebe Waller-Bridge is a big, brittle plank of wood with cooked spaghetti noodles for arms. It is obvious that she would not be capable of the physical feats this movie would like you to believe she is capable of. Her roof jump in heels is cringe. Her car chase combat acrobatics are laughable. That whole chase sequence doesn't work. It should have been done in a way that allows for the fact that Indy is a very old man and Indiana Jane is a stick insect in human form. Instead, it chooses to ignore these facts, pretends that Indy is 40 years younger and Indiana Jane is a shredded male gymnast. Suspension of disbelief can only go so far. I can believe that a man who looks like a world-class bodybuilder is actually a killing machine from the future. I cannot ever believe that a woman who looks like the physical manifestation of clumsiness could pursue and harass a convoy of heavily armed mercenaries, jumping between speeding vehicles as she does so because she has to one-up Indy's capture of the truck in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. The choreography in that scene featuring a stuntman being dragged underneath a truck is legend. And as for Indiana Jane punching out Indy near the end of the movie? Well, that was fun. Sorry, wrong clip. That was remade Wendy slapping remade Peter Pan to the ground in another recent Disney production. That's about as convincing as me taking out Tyson Fury with a first round KO. You're going down, my friend. Yes, sir, Mr. Burns. The guard boss choreography in Indiana Jones 5 is embarrassing. There is one scene which perfectly sums up Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character. She has just let off a stick of dynamite in the boat, killing several men for all she knows, and Indy's old friend has just been murdered. During the escape from the bad guys, with her piloting the boat, naturally, she begins laughing. <laughs> just murdered. You know what this reminds me of? Yes, we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> Did it have anything to do with your visit? No. Oh. This is the sociopath who was clearly intended by Kathleen Kennedy as a replacement for Indy, and who, in the original ending Kathleen Kennedy wanted, picked up Indy's hat from his still warm corpse and placed it on her head, signalling that she, Indiana Jane, was the new and improved Indiana Jones. That ending was scrapped by Disney following horrendously bad test screenings. The only time this movie acknowledges that the audience didn't come to see Phoebe Waller-Bridge is at the end, when she excuses herself to give Indy a moment alone with his ex-fling from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Apart from that, she is always there. A constant, obnoxious presence and a reminder that this is a Lucasfilm production and that, however many times it has failed in previous productions, Kathleen Kennedy is determined to replace the heroes of the past with the boring Mary Sues of the present.
That is another massive problem with Indiana Jones 5. The story is driven by this interloping, toxic feminist Indiana Jones clone made female. Indy is responding to her suggestions and leadership. He is following her around. She is driving the plot. He leaves New York in pursuit of her and is literally dragged back there by her. He is a passenger on her adventure. Also, Hitler made mistakes. And with this, I will correct them all. You stole it. Then you stole it. And then I stole it. It's called capitalism. No it isn't, that's called feudalism. A system of government based on top-down organised theft. Capitalism is the opposite, a system of government which opposes government theft through taxation and allows individuals to keep the money they have earned. Now on to the third member of our treacherous trio, Knock Off Shorty. Before we discuss the character, let's first talk about the actor. He's fucking terrible. Did I say that kid who played Village Wench's son in Rings of Power was bad? Kid who plays Village Wench's son, if it's any consolation, as bad as you were, you are an infinitely better actor than Knock Off Shorty. How, in the name of Kali, did this wee guy end up in front of a movie camera? He is lamentable. He botches every single line, even his one word lines. And when he has to speak full sentences, it's just painful to watch. What are we doing? Okay, so he's like running the show now. I just thought we were in this for all the wrong reasons. You know he's never gonna let us sell any of that stuff. His facial expressions don't reflect what he's saying. He doesn't know what he's supposed to be doing with his face or body. He doesn't know how to react to what's being said to him. And his cause is not helped by that ridiculous line of mouse fur under his nose. Obviously the filmmakers wanted to make Knock Off Shorty look cute or endearing in an attempt to ape Shorty from the Temple of Doom. But it just had the opposite effect. It looks bloody awful. Knock Off is supposed to be Indiana Jane's sidekick, but unsurprisingly, there is no chemistry between Phoebe Waller-Bridge and the nominal actor who plays Knock Off. I am absolutely serious in saying that there is more charm, charisma, and humor in Ki Hui Kwan's smile in Shorty's character intro in The Temple of Doom than there is in Knock Off Shorty's entire performance. As for the character, he's basically just a cheat code for the script, which it uses anytime it needs something to happen. Indiana Jane needs to get involved in the action during the tuk-tuk chase. Knock Off will drive the world's fastest tuk-tuk through the crowded and narrow streets of Marrakesh. Indiana Jane needs to follow Indy in an airplane. Knock Off will fly the plane that is conveniently fueled up and waiting to go with no impediment to its usage. Someone needs to stop the bad guys from shooting Indy and Indiana Jane. Knock Off will do it. Here, put him on a practically functionless platform at a convenient height from the bad guys and have him jump on top of one of them. Apart from being a cheat code, Knock Off is just a detestable character. In one scene, he gets bored, so he walks over to a random boy and pickpockets him. There is absolutely no need to do this. Indy and Indiana Jane don't need money. Knock Off just does it because presumably he's a habitual thief. Now, Disney think the audience will view this as wily and clever. From Disney's perspective, they're showing off the awesome skills of Shorty 2.0, and the victim of his theft is a white boy dressed in expensive clothes, so presumably he's from a wealthy family. He's just a rich white male, which makes him a Dalit in the intersectional caste system. Thus, he is a legitimate target for a thief. If this were a black girl, it would be a terrible crime. But against a rich white boy, it's commendable. An opportunity to show off the new and improved Shorty. In Temple of Doom, we learn that Indy met Shorty in Shanghai when Shorty tried to pickpocket him. Shorty's family were killed when the Japanese bombed Shanghai. He's been living on the streets since he was four. I caught him trying to pick my pocket. Didn't I, short stuff? Disney think that because Shorty was a pickpocket, it's okay for knockoff Shorty to be a pickpocket. Only knockoff does it better. What Disney fail to realize is that Shorty being a pickpocket is part of his sympathetic backstory. He stole from strangers because his parents were killed by the Japanese. He's an orphan and theft is his only means of feeding himself. Indy took pity on him and basically adopted him. It is a heart-wrenchingly sad backstory and further endears the audience to Shorty. Knock off picks pockets because he's a degenerate thief. 
He commits this crime not to keep himself from starving to death, but for money and personal amusement. He is also more than old enough to know better. Shorty was a pre-adolescent child who didn't know any better. Knock Off is a teenager who knows what he's doing is wrong and doesn't care. Disney are so morally backward that they fail to understand the moral chasm that exists between Shorty and Knock Off Shorty. Shorty acts out of desperation, Knock Off acts out of predation. He is a rotten little scumbag. Indiana Jane is a hateful character and Knock Off is the perfect sidekick for her because he is fucking detestable. Before I move on, I want to briefly demonstrate what a truly excellent sidekick Shorty is. He's charming, hilarious, adorable, and probably the most likable character in indie canon. Take a look at this joke from Temple of Doom. Mister! Mister! Oh, Mister, wait! You call him Dr. Jones! Oh, okay, Dr. Jones! <laughs> that is wonderful stuff. Genuinely laugh out loud funny. Not just the line delivery, the direction is also perfect. Look at how his head just pops into the frame when he says the line. You call him Dr. Jones, oh. okay. Magic. Here's another beautifully filmed visual gag when Shorty imitates Indy's body language. And there is a visual callback to this gag in the movie's final act. Look at the framing, Indy in the foreground taking up most of the shot, Shorty in the background to Indy's right, exactly the same blocking for both shots, peak Spielberg, and a reminder of just how far Hollywood has fallen. In a perfect world when Indiana Jane interrupts Indy's quiet drink, Ki Hui Kwan shows up in a tuxedo looking like an absolute fucking boss says you call him Dr. Jones, oh. tells the bitch to get lost then Indy and Shorty head off in search of Atlantis <laughs> unfortunately we don't live in a perfect world we live in worst timeline if anyone watching this video does ever come into possession of the Dial of Destiny please use it to go back in time and stop George Lucas from selling Lucasfilm to Disney. Just take a copy of The Last Jedi with you and show it to him. He'll cancel the deal at about 10 minutes in. By the way, that line that Ki Hui Kwan delivers to that doll who presumed to call Dr. Jones Mr. deserves an award. The winner of the most magnificent delivery of the most fucking based line in cinema history goes to... The MacGuffin in Indy 5 is wrong. It was created by writers who fundamentally misunderstand the role of an Indiana Jones MacGuffin. Describing a MacGuffin from a previous iteration of the Indy 5 script, the director and one of this movie's many writers, James Mangold, said it was, quote, just another relic with power, similar to the relics we had seen. This is how Mangold views the MacGuffins from the original trilogy, just relics with powers. And his MacGuffin, the Dial of Destiny, was cooler than the previous relics because it was a time machine built by an ancient Doc Brown. At least I think that's what the Dial of Destiny is. I'm honestly not sure if the Dial locates fissures in time or creates them. The movie was not clear on that point. If the function of the Dial was made clear during the extensive runtime of this movie, I was either too bored to notice or out taking a piss. The MacGuffins in Indiana Jones were not just ancient relics with powers, they were characters in the movie. The most obvious example of a MacGuffin that is also a character is the One Ring in The Lord of the Rings. It talks to characters in the story, tries to seduce them with its power, it is described by Frodo as treacherous, it is regarded by Gollum as a beloved companion, and Gollum warns that the ring wants to return to Sauron. The anthropomorphization of the ring is obvious. Viewers know that the ring is a thinking being with desires and designs. The sentience of the Indiana Jones MacGuffins is far more subtle. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Ark gives off its own golden glow as if it has a life force. In one scene, it burns the swastika on the crate in which it's being carried, but without destroying the crate. 
This foreshadows the burning of the German expedition at the end of the movie, but also indicates that the Ark will, of its own accord, destroy evil it comes into contact with. At the end of the movie, Indy and Marion are spurred during the Ark's destruction of everyone in the vicinity. They were as close to the Ark's fire as many who were killed by it, and yet they survived. The only explanation for this is that the Ark chose to spur them. We are led to believe that this is because Indy closes his eyes and tells Marion to do the same, but even if this did save them, how did Indy know to do this? That's a very specific method of defense. It's possible he read somewhere during his extensive research that the Ark would destroy anyone arrogant enough to presume to be worthy of its secrets, but it's more likely that the Ark told Indy to close his eyes, or Indy having his eyes closed didn't matter and the Ark chose to spare him of its own volition. There are many indications in Temple of Doom that the Sankara stones are sentient, but I'll give two more obvious ones. When Indy first comes into contact with the stones, his face takes on an enamoured, lustful look and is lit up by an infernal red glow. The stone clearly being the source of this demonic light, the red symbolising Indy's temptation by evil. Shortly after this, he briefly turns evil after being forced to drink the blood of Kali. But was it the blood that turned him evil, or the stones? Or a combination of the two? Later, after Indy captures the stones, he knocks out two very tough looking guards, literally sending one of them flying. This is the only time in the movie he demonstrates such superhuman strength, which suggests that the stones granted Indy a superhuman capacity for violence in order to protect themselves from being separated again. Indy also performs feats of superhuman strength in Raiders of the Lost Ark, suggesting that the Ark is aiding Indy in his quest by granting him powers beyond ordinary human capacity. The agency of the MacGuffins in Indiana Jones is indicated at the very start of the first movie, when Indy sees a golden Aztec head, it glows with its own light and seems to communicate a warning. And of course, it has a face, indicating that it is a thinking being, which it is, as all the MacGuffins in Indiana Jones are. The relics in the OG trilogy are also of spiritual significance. The Ark of the Covenant and the Holy Grail are important Christian relics. The Sankara stones are fictional, but they are shown to have immense religious importance and spiritual power. They are also an excellent dark variant on the Ark from the first movie. Rather than just repeat themselves with another relic of light, which they had in Raiders of the Lost Ark, Spielberg and Lucas decided to have a relic of darkness for the second movie. Another essential element of the Indiana Jones relics is that they punish those who seek to misuse them. The German soldiers acting under the orders of the German government who ruled Germany from 1933 to 1945, and whose political party YouTube does not like named, are massacred by the Ark for attempting to use it for evil purposes. In the Temple of Doom, the stones, when united, cause insanity in those around them. Kalima protects us. We are her children. We pledge our devotion to her with an offering of flesh. This applies not only to the zombie guards who drank the blood of Gali, but to the leaders of the cult. Listen to the World Conquest monologue by Mola Ram, the leader of the Gali cult. The British in India will be slaughtered, then we will overrun the Muslims, then the Hebrew God will fall, and then the Christian God will be cast down and forgotten. Soon, Kali will rule the world. This isn't even crazy ambition, it's a hallucination from a man who has been driven mad with the delusion of power. As mentioned, Indy goes crazy after coming into possession of all three stones, and only snaps out of it when Shorty burns him. Indy, I love you! Wake up! But even these demonic stones, when separate from one another, can do good. One stone on its own brings life to a village, allowing the people there to thrive. When the stone was stolen from them, the village became a barren wasteland. In the last crusade, the Holy Grail destroys the man who dared to presume himself worthy of its power, and who wanted to wield that power for nefarious purposes. But it also has the power to do good when used with moral intention, and chooses to save Indy's father's life. The Grail also gives a final test to Elsa, who has gone some way to redeeming herself by knowingly giving a false Grail to the villain Donovan. But in order to be truly redeemed, she must let go of power-hungry ambition. She is tested and... Give me your hand, give me your other hand! Chose 
warning. Indy is also tested, but being pure of heart. I can almost reach it, Dad. Let it go. He chose wisely. The MacGuffin in Indy 5, The Dial of Destiny, doesn't have a personality. It is not a character. It does not enhance the abilities of the bearer. It does not punish those who misuse it or reward those who use it with pure hearted intent. It has no spiritual significance. It has no will. It, like the foul movie it inhabits, has no soul. It is just a dead hunk of metal. The Dial of Destiny is a sterile plot device, not worthy of the title of Indiana Jones MacGuffin. For that reason, I, the despot, by the power vested in me by my subscribers, hereby strip the dial of its title, Indiana Jones MacGuffin. It shall henceforth be known as a Disney Lucasfilm plot device. Near the end of the movie, we learn that the former Guys Who Lost World War II rocket scientist generic villain is heading into the wrong time warp because, despite being a literal rocket scientist, he forgot to take continental drift into account in his calculations when figuring out where he needed to go in order to arrive back in 1939 so he could kill Hitler and somehow win the war thereafter. More on his ludicrous plan later. Generic villain ends up arriving in ancient Syracuse, which is under attack from Rome. The Syracusians shoot down the plane with anti-naval scorpions. More on that nonsense in the plot holes section of this video. Generic villain and the henchmen that have somehow survived the girl boss badassery of Indiana Jane all die in the plane crash. They died not because of hubris, ill intent or egotistical delusion, but because of basic incompetence. Indy 5 suggests that if generic villain had taken continental drift into account, he would have succeeded in his diabolical plot to ensure the final victory of the Thousand Year Reich. This shows that Disney Lucasfilm have absolutely no understanding of the moral heart of Indiana Jones. In the original trilogy, Evil is defeated because it is evil. Evil is destined to lose. A moral lesson that is evidenced by Disney themselves, since they are a failing company that is losing badly on the cinematic front of the culture war, a battle that they started in 2015 with The Force Awakens. It is unsurprising that Disney have no understanding of Indiana Jones' basic moral framework. Another important element of Indiana Jones that Disney Lucasfilm got wrong was the villain. Indy 5's villain, generic villain, is a character template with nothing done to the template. Disney decided that they wanted an evil former guy who lost World War II as the villain. Standard cinema bad guy, okay, no problem. And now what? Maybe make him hilariously non-self-aware as a basis for great gags? Good evening, Fraulein. The bar is closed. We oh, yeah. We are not thirsty. No? Okay. Perhaps he enjoys a drink a little too much and has a soft spot for the ladies. <laughs> what is this stuff, Renee? <laughs> I grew up with this. <laughs> it's my family label. <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? A straight white man flirting with a woman in a Disney movie. All right. Um, oh, he's a highly intelligent opportunist who enjoys toying with his prey and clearly has a strong sadistic streak in him. No? All right, then what? What do you want to do with this bad guy who lost World War II template? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Disney take a basic film archetype and do nothing with it. Despite having my man Mads Mikkelsen, one of the best villain actors in cinema, the man who played Le Chiffre in Casino Royale and Hannibal Lecter in the quite good but short-lived show Hannibal, generic villain has no personality to speak of outside of what Mads Mikkelsen brought to the role. He has no habits or interests or earthly vices or personal problems or complex relationships or odd tics. He's just a bad guy that lost World War II and his plan doesn't even make sense. He wants to ensure the German victory in World War II. Then why would he go back to 1939 before Germany had even conquered Poland? The best time to go back would be June 1941. The Germans had just conquered Greece and defeated the large British force sent there to help defend the country. This was Germany at the height of its power, but before the disastrous invasion of the Soviet Union, which we know today with the benefit of hindsight, had very little chance of succeeding. 
invading, kill Hitler or convince him not to invade Russia. Either is fine. But pre-World War II 1939, here's how generic villain's plan should have gone. So as it turns out in the big reveal, generic villain was heavily involved in the medical experiments carried out at Auschwitz, where he was working on a serum that would turn German soldiers into monster warriors. He got close, but the Russians overran the camp before he could finish his work. Now he has perfected the serum and wants to go back in time to give it to Hitler so Germany wins. But when they arrive in 1939, he arrives in a horrendous storm. As it turns out, he forgot to check what the weather was like on that day. The plane crash lands and as he lies down, he drags the serum towards himself and injects large quantities of it. He turns into a horrifying monstrosity, runs at great speed out of the plane crash, straight at Hitler, says, For so long, I thought you were the future. I was wrong. I am the future then kills Hitler and declares himself the Fuhrer. The movie ends on a cliffhanger setting us up for our next movie, Indiana Jones 6, Indy vs. the Monster Fuhrer. The villains in Indiana Jones are supposed to be colourful and fun like Major Tut or larger than life like Mullah Ram. Generic villain has none of the things that a good villain should be. He is a digestive biscuit served with a glass of water wasted on a great actor. Anyone who was unfortunate enough to watch this movie in its entirety may have felt that the ending was off. It didn't feel like an ending is supposed to feel. This is because nothing was achieved, nothing has changed and no one has grown as a character. Indy is still just a depressed old loser. In the previous scene he didn't even want to return home because he felt he had nothing to live for. He had to be literally taken home against his will by Indiana Jane. He ends the movie as he started it hopeless. Disney tried to cadence the movie optimistically by tossing in that broad from Raiders of the Lost Ark, not Indy's ex-wife from Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, because that movie never happened. You are outside history. You can exist. But this does not change the nature of the character we have just seen portrayed on screen for two and a half hours. It's just a ham-fisted attempt to tell the audience that Indy has gone through a meaningful character arc. But we know this is a lie because we just saw the movie and it failed completely to show us that. He didn't go through any arc. Indiana Jane started as a sociopathic, obnoxious know-it-all Mary Sue and she is exactly the same character at the end, having learned Nothing. If anything, she is even more sure of how resourceful, daring, beautiful, self-sufficient she is. She should have been punished for her arrogance, presumption and ambition as all villains in Indiana Jones are. At the end of The Last Crusade, Elsa is punished for her role in bringing the villain to the Grail and for her determination to take the Grail not for spiritual purification or the benefit of mankind but as an archaeological prize that would satisfy her egotistical ambition. Elsa never really believed in the Grail. She thought she'd found a prize. But the Grail acknowledges that she has gone some way to redeeming herself, killing the villain and helping to save Indy's father. So rather than destroy her outright, it gives her a chance to save herself. Give me your hand, give me your other hand! Indiana Jane covets the dial not even as an archaeological prize, but as a stolen car stereo that she can hawk on the black market to enrich herself, and she's perfectly happy to sell it to the villain if the price is right. She's far worse than Elsa. The moral principles of Indiana Jones demand that Helena Shaw be destroyed as punishment for her sins, but she isn't. This is an outrageous miscarriage of justice and the audience feels this injustice. Another reason the ending is so wrong. Knock Off is still a rancid piece of street vermin. Salah is there but he didn't get to go on this adventure. Because having more Salah in the movie would be in danger of pleasing fans and taking precious screen time away from Indiana Jane. At the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indy had secured the Ark, gotten the girl and learned not to trust the US government. By Temple of Doom's ending, he had defeated the villain, saved the village, strengthened his relationship with Shorty and got the girl. Over the course of the Last Crusade, Indy learned to turn away from obsessed of ambition and fixed his broken relationship with his father. At the end of Dial of Destiny, nothing. There is only one other movie I can think of that has a comparable ending. There is no catharsis. My punishment continues to elude me and I gain no deeper knowledge of myself. 
No new knowledge can be extracted from my telling. This confession has meant nothing. Before I get on to the plot hole section of this piece, I will say I did enjoy the movie's opening. It was a great action set piece opener and the de-aging CGI was very impressive. De-aged Indy and generic villain both looked great. Not perfect, Indy's teeth, voice and body are not those of a young man, but it's a hell of a lot better than evil doppelganger Leia, Luke Skinwalker and video game cutscene Moff Tarkin. And I think John Williams did a great job with the score. An excellent real world example of the fact that, contrary to Lucasfilm dogma, not every old man is a desiccated ruin of his younger self. Now, plot holes and plot contrivances. I cannot go into detail on every one of these because if I did, this video will still be playing by the time Disney release a good movie, something that will only happen after the rapture, when Disney have been morally cleansed by the angel of death. Karen iPhone, the music. How did generic villain survive being hit by a metal pole at the speed of a racing train? How did generic villain acquire his henchmen? Why does this movie feature a scene of an 80 year old Indy riding a horse through a subway onto a subway platform while being chased by a train? Why does Indy trust Indiana Jane after she lied to him, conned him, stole from him and left him for dead? How did Salah know where the auction of the dial would be held? Despite the journey of several thousand miles, Indy arrives at the auction just as it is starting. Bad Guy arrives right after him, again after a journey of several thousand miles. Why doesn't generic villain just outbid everyone for the dial? Why is Indiana Jane's ex-fiance in the movie? You know, the guy who shows up, disappears and is never seen or mentioned again? How is a woman who looks like a tall plank of wood with two cooked spaghetti strings attached to it able to successfully assault a moving convoy of experienced mercenaries armed with automatic machine guns? Why does any man find tall plank of wood with cooked spaghetti strings attached to it attractive? When Indy arrives at the docks to see if his old friend can take them out on the boat, the boat is waiting right there with the entire crew on dry deck for some reason, with nothing better to do than take Indy out straight away. Why doesn't the ship blow up when a stick of dynamite is set off inside its lower deck? Why doesn't the boat sink following the massive damage that would be incurred by a stick of dynamite blowing up inside it? Why don't the bad guys frisk Indiana Jane on the boat? Are these men not experienced mercenaries? Wouldn't the first thing they do be to establish control by securing all prisoners and weapons? Why doesn't everyone in the vicinity of a stick of dynamite blowing up in a small enclosed space die? How did generic bad guy locate Indy's boat? He figured the general direction they were going in, but you would need quite a bit more information than that to get their exact location. Bad guy manages to locate and catch up to Indy's boat during the exact time frame everyone is underwater in a sequence that was one of the worst decisions in this entire movie. Why didn't Disney hire a second unit director who actually knew how to film underwater? The underwater scene is the worst looking part of this movie and it is impossible to tell who is who. Indy and Indiana Jane need to pursue the bad guys after they kidnap knockoff. Oh look, a vehicle is fueled up waiting and ready with the doors open and the keys inside. How did they find Archimedes tomb again? That seemed easy, how was it able to stay hidden for so long? How did generic bad guy arrive at the location of Archimedes tomb? Why has no one discovered this tomb before? How did Knockoff manage to manipulate the body weight of a man 14 times his size? How did Knockoff unlock the cuffs so easily while underwater and almost out of breath? How did Knockoff manage to get from wherever he ended up after his escape from man 14 times his size to the platform that he jumped onto the bad guys from? How did Knockoff make his way to that platform so quickly while walking through pitch black underground tunnels? Why doesn't generic villain take any of the many opportunities he has to kill Indy and Indiana Jane? He has no use for them. Why doesn't generic villain or any of the henchmen kill Knockoff? He's useless to them and can only hinder their plans and he's very annoying. I wouldn't blame them for killing Knockoff just to be free from the sight of him? Generic villains henchmen are mercenaries who think nothing of murdering sweet old ladies in libraries just to ensure there are no witnesses to their presence. Why would such utterly ruthless men hesitate to kill Indy, Indiana Jane or Knockoff? The bad guys catch up to Indy at the very moment he finds the second half of the dial. Knockoff and Indiana Jane need to follow villains plane. Oh look, 
A fully fueled, unsecured, unlocked plane that generic villain hasn't bothered to disable. Quick, get knockoff who has never flown a plane before to fly it. At night. How did a rocket scientist forget about continental drift when calculating his journey to the past? Why does Indy tell generic villain about this miscalculation? Is he trying to help him? How did the Syracusians shoot down a plane with ancient anti-naval artillery? How did Indiana Jones stay unconscious the entire time when Indiana Jane knocked him out with one of her super-powered spaghetti arms in ancient Syracuse to when he woke up in bed in New York? If he lost enough blood to keep him unconscious for several hours, he would have had to be rushed to hospital as soon as possible, or he would certainly have died. But I guess Indiana Jane is just that powerful. Watch out, Alexander Usyk. Indy is wanted for murder before he leaves New York, but by the end of the movie, the authorities seem to have forgotten about this. The only good thing about Indiana Jones and the dire two and a half hours of cinematic misery is that it got me to rewatch the original Indiana Jones trilogy, and those movies are truly great. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, the female character doesn't scream at the audience to demonstrate the qualities of her character. Instead, we are introduced to her with a drinking game which shows the audience that she is determined, competitive, stubborn, likes a drink, and can hold her own. And all that is communicated without one word being spoken. Villains don't fuck around. When Indy and some random broad gets in the bad guy's way, he orders his men to Shoot them. Shoot them both. The villains are slimy, scurry and hilarious. A man behaves like a man and tells the tag-along dame to Get out of here! Women rely on wit for their victories. Here, a local who seems very satisfied with the camel shit stew he's just eaten for lunch chases after Marion. She finds a retreat, then clubs him over the head. Of course, now women just jump straight in and start breaking bottles. There are Jungian references to Indiana Jones as a morally ambiguous character. You and I are very much alike. Archaeology is our religion. Yet we have both fallen from the pure faith. Our methods have not differed as much as you pretend. I am a shadowy reflection of you. Now his character is just insulted and attacked from a politically motivated position of moral sanctimony. Women actually behave like women. <laughs> now... <laughs> and frequently the audience is allowed to just enjoy Indy doing his thing. Being a man, solving problems, fighting bad guys. A wonderful reminder that there was a time when heroes weren't shadowed in every fucking scene by an annoying female version of himself who he has to constantly justify himself to. And that is just a smattering of the greatness of the first movie in one of the greatest movie trilogies ever made. The real story of Indiana Jones ended when Indy and his father rode off together into the sunset. Thanks for listening, subscribe, and don't forget to the like button.